am here with Donald Aidhood, who was born on February 1st, 1945. He served in Vietnam in the Army. His high, highest rank achieved was Lieutenant Colonel, and the date and place of this recording is April 22nd, 2009, at his home. My name is Claire Mulk, and Dr. Hood is a good family friend. How old were you when the Vietnam War began? Um, approximately 18, maybe 17. It, it was it'd been going on for a long time, but it wasn't an official war till I was probably in high school. How old were you when you joined the army? I joined the army when I was 22. What made you want to join the army? Um, it it wasn't that simple because uh, I had no choice. Uh, I was in optometry school and uh, the army uh, drafted 100% of the optometrists for the for the uh, war effort because they needed all of us. So so. That's why I joined the Army, because I knew I would be drafted within six months. And uh, so I really didn't think much about it. What were your views on the Vietnam War? I was confused. Uh, it seemed like a patriotic thing to do, to be, um, to uh, join the military and help our country in, in a war. Um, but with the protests and the problems, it was very confusing uh, to me. Did you know many people who were drafted into the Army? Yes. What All of my high school buddies uh, either enlisted or were drafted. What were their reactions to, for those who were drafted? Um, they were um, afraid because uh, most of them were drafted into the infantry and were, were, would ended up in combat. And a few of them didn't want to leave their jobs that they had out of high school. Uh, but there was no choice. Did you follow the war closely before you became involved? I did. It was concerning to me and, uh, and confusing. And I wanted to have a strong opinion, but it was hard to, hard to figure out what was right and what wasn't. Um, what training and schooling did you complete to become an optometrist? Um, after high school, uh, I went to college for uh, um, Typically, people get into optometry school after four years of college. Uh, I went summers also and got into optometry school after three years. And then optometry school was uh, uh, three years. And um, uh, that, then I was completed. I, uh, at the time, um, there were very few uh, extra residencies to do. And since the Army was going to draft me anyway, I enlisted. What training did you have to go through to become the first airborne optometrist? Mm -hmm. uh, I was at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, when I uh, when I uh, enlisted, and um, I went through basic training in uh, at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, where we learned how to be a soldier and uh, learned how to fire weapons. And then uh, at, at Fort Bragg, when I volunteered to to go. Uh, to join the 82nd Airborne Division, I was sent to uh, for uh, to four months to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, where they teach you how to jump out of airplanes and how to be a better soldier. Uh, airborne soldiers are better soldiers than than non-airborne soldiers. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> what other tasks were you asked to do besides those for optometry? Um. When I uh, certainly we we had lots of uh, physical training, lots of we had to uh, jump out of airplanes to be qualified. Um, I, uh, in addition to that, we had combat training because uh, 82nd Airborne Division is always at the front lines 
of wars. They're our first strike force, so uh, they were at, up and uh, at the uh, demilitarized zone uh, next to North Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and so um, we we had to uh, train for combat. And when I was in Laos, we uh, 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 we had combat. What were some of your fears before leaving the United States to go to Indochina? It was. Uh, it was it was scary because I didn't know what it was like. Uh, I just just knew uh, I've had two high school friends that were killed in Vietnam before I went, and uh, one that lost a leg. And uh, I think my your fears are more of losing an arm or a leg or an eye or something than being killed because it seems so awful as a as a teenager or as a young man. What cities were you stationed in? I, um, before going to Indochina, I was in, uh, as I've mentioned, San Antonio, Texas, uh, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, um, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Then I was uh, sent to Bangkok, Thailand. And from there, I was sent to um, Saigon and also to uh, Vientiane, Laos. When did you move to Laos? I was in Laos two times uh, for two different tours. Um, uh, I was in Laos in 1970, approximately uh, October, November, and December, January. And then I was in 1971 from uh, uh, June, July, and August. Um, during your wartime experiences, were you able to receive letters? In Bangkok, I was. Um, in Fort Bragg, I was. In Laos, I was not. Were you? Was no communication when in Laos with... Uh, there was no communications until I got back to Thailand. Um, when you were able to receive letters, were you also to send them back, able to send them back out? Yes. In, in, in Thailand, yes. In Vietnam, yes, but in Laos, there was uh, there was no communications. Um, what were what were some like worries about like being in Laos and not being able to communicate with people at home? Um, I felt sorry for my mother. My my father passed away when I was uh, twenty, but uh, and my brothers. Um, because they didn't know how I was, and um, they they knew that, uh, they didn't know what country I was in. It was it, uh, um, at that time um, uh, uh, military in Laos was uh, um, classified, and uh, it was very complicated with the politics. And uh, officially, we did not have. Uh, any combat soldiers in Laos. So uh, I couldn't tell them where I was. I just said I'm going to be out of contact and, uh, and uh, I, I wasn't sure when I'd come back. My fear was that if I was killed that they'd, they'd never uh, get my body. What did your daily routine include in Laos? Um, I was there as an optometrist and um, I was uh, the U.S. government had a secret hospital where we attempted to train Laotians to uh, treat their injuries. The interesting thing was we treated everybody. We treated our enemies in addition to, we treated North Vietnamese, we treated Chinese, we treated Russians, we treated uh, Laos, there was five armies fighting in Laos. And so we, um, every day, uh, we had a line that we never could finish of uh, patients. And um, it was frustrating because uh, a lot of the things I saw I was not trained to handle. And, you know, a bullet in the eye, uh, heads blown off, and we didn't, you know, they'd bring them to me and it was, there was no library, there was nothing to study, there was no internet, there was nobody to ask, and I did the best I could and it was, it was hard work. It was uh, gut-wrenching. 
what was it like being in such a foreign place? It was very interesting culturally. Uh, I didn't have much interaction with the local people uh, other than the ones that worked at the hospital. Uh, uh, we weren't officially allowed to go anywhere uh, other than where we li lived and, and where we worked. Uh, but just the people I worked with, their, their culture was so different. Uh, uh, the Hmong fighters, the, uh, their cultures were so different than what my little town where I grew up. It was, uh, it was fascinating. I talked for hours after, after uh, over dinners and with, the, with the different people that I had no idea that people could have been to 30 years old and never seen a television. Or, or, or never had a had a car, had ridden a bicycle, and uh, didn't know where America was. They just didn't know. How about the climate? Was it really hot? Bad? Really hot and really really hot. <laughs> humid and really humid. Um, in the. In the summer, it was 100 to 120 and 98 percent humidity, and we were soaking wet all day long. No air conditioning. So. <laughs> Did it make it really difficult to work? And... It, you got used to it. it. It took about it takes about six months, and your body acclimates to it. But it was just really hot, and uh, it was hard to sleep at night. Uh, mosquito nets we'd get under, but it was. Where I in Laos, where I was, there were no fans either. There was no electricity at night, so uh, and no lights, so it was it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier that like some of the situations you were faced with, you were not trained for. Were there any like specific ones that you'd like to share? Like any other kinds of situations that you weren't ready for? Well, the most frustrating was that when the people I treated were really injured and had eye injuries and head injuries, um, we only had one antibiotic uh, that we could use. So it didn't matter. And if it didn't work, um, you know, they, they got sick and died and, uh, uh, or lost more parts of their body than they needed to. And that was just sickening. So um, I wish we would have had more and more medicines, but we didn't. Um, why were you and everybody else who was stationed there in Laos? We were in Laos uh, in this hospital doing, helping, helping the Laotian people for two reasons. One is that uh, that's the way America is. We help people that need our help. Uh, and number two is um, the American military needed um, needed the country of Laos because uh, uh, the uh, Chinese would uh, on on the other side of is Vietnam, Laos is in between, and then there's China. And the Chinese were supplying the North Vietnamese in the war, and the Ho Chi Minh Trail came through Laos, so where the where weapons were coming, so. Uh, we needed to try to thwart that resupply of fresh men and ammunition that were killing our people. So that's why we were there and that's why we bombed them and that's why we hired the Hmong and Laotian soldiers to fight our battle for us. Did you feel a certain way towards being involved in the secret war in Laos? I volunteered for it, so um, I felt strongly that whatever we could do to win the war and stop the war was my little part was a good thing to do. By that time I had a firm opinion that we needed to win the war or quit, and uh, winning was better than quitting. Um, why did you have to keep it a secret that you guys were stationed there? Um, 
because with the Geneva Convention, the U.S. Uh, were not authorized to have military in Laos. And um, although my mission was not to fight, my mission was to help, and that's um, officially we couldn't be there. There was no eye doctor in the whole country of Laos. There was one French eye doctor that was an alcoholic, and he would show up once a month, get his paycheck. Um, what did you have to do to keep it a secret? I didn't tell anybody where I was, and um, didn't talk about it. It was, uh, it was, it was uh, a pretty easy thing to do. I just didn't talk about it for 30 years. So even after you came home, you didn't mention that you were in Laos? Yeah, it was, um, my orders were to never talk about it. But since then, they've opened up the records, and I, I can now, but uh, my wife, Trisha, didn't know about it. It's uh, um, you, military training and, and keeping secrets is an easy thing to do if you take it serious. Just don't, don't talk about it. Um, how did the Laotians you came in contact with treat you? Uh, perfect. They would do anything for me. Uh, partially because that's the Laotian way. They're wonderful, caring, loving people. And secondly, is I was there to help them. And uh, I examined the royal family in Laos, um, the uh, offspring of the king and queen, on down to uh, uh, the lowliest foot soldier. And they're all wonderful. Um, did you or anyone you knew get in trouble for being in Laos, or was there a fear that you were going to get caught? Every day we, we were afraid that um, one of the different armies would uh, kill us. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know what happened. We did have a battle where I was where, where we were overrun, and I don't know what happened to my friends. Never did know. So that it bothers me today. Is there something I could have done to help them? Um, I don't know if they uh, lived or not. I do know that in a recent trip that the Laotian that I had trained to be an eye doctor was killed. Um, you had mentioned earlier that you guys worked with Hmong soldiers, and what were your feelings towards them? Because there's a lot of controversy over whether, like, the Americans, like, were just using them to take their place in battle and, yeah. Um, the Hmong are incredible people, bravest people I've ever uh, known, besides the U.S. U.S. Army soldiers, the bravest soldiers in the world, toughest, best soldiers in the world best trained. Um, the Hmong, um, the whole family goes to war. The, and um, if the father's killed, then the oldest son takes over and it goes down to the children and the wives. And um, I was happy that they were helping to save American lives. Uh, I felt awful when I'd see a 13-year-old with a gun, knowing that it's probably going to get killed too. Uh, um, but they, um, wherever the Hmong fought, um, whoever they were fighting feared them because they were not afraid to die. No fear of death. It was their, their mission. So they were so poor that the money that they got from us they knew would help their family if they survived. And if we didn't win the war, they knew that they were, they would be killed or, or tortured. Um, you said you had fears of being like caught being in Laos when you weren't supposed to be. What were some other fears you had while you were there? Uh, getting sick. <clears throat> uh, the sanitation was awful. The food was local, people's food. And, uh, it's very common to, to get 
sick from the food, get malaria, dinghy fever. There was always somebody that had malaria, which was, was not curable. So, And uh, we didn't know it, but Agent Orange we used a lot, and uh, turns out that wasn't good for you also. Um, what about like combat situations? Were you ever attacked or in any sort of battle? Um, where we stayed at night was overrun one day, and that was my last day in Laos. We, they came at night and um, came through. I, uh, it was awful. And I could hear the grenades going off, and the, they'd go th throw a grenade in each hooch that we stayed in, and uh, not, you don't know what to do. Do you grab your weapon and run outside and get killed, or do you try to hide and get killed? So, yes, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to, I was injured, and when they came through, I think they thought I was dead uh, from a hand grenade. And uh, um, I hid, and it took me a couple days, and I got across the Mekong River into Thailand, and eventually got back to Bangkok. Um, when we had talked on the phone originally, you mentioned something about the Tet Offensive, and how, was that what this battle was? No. Um, the Tet was in Vietnam, and um, although I did work some in Vietnam, it uh, was not during Tet. So uh, I, we just knew it, and we wondered if uh, how successful that was going to be. It was a very big concern. Were you expecting to be like flown out to Vietnam and like during the Tet Offensive after like you found out it was? Uh, yes, uh, I mean we hoped that we wouldn't and, and the Tet was fairly quick and, and so when it was over before uh, they had a chance to uh, resupply from Thailand where I was. Um, as an optometrist and working on soldier, soldiers, did you ever have any stories told to you by them that really affected you? Um, many and uh, uh, I liked to hear them because most of the stories were not the bad stuff. They talked about the camaraderie and how brave their fellow soldiers were. And um, uh, the, I volunteered to go. After, uh, I could have gotten out of the Army after two years at Fort Bragg, but I was treating the airborne soldiers that came back, and they, they were all re-enlisting and going back to help finish the war. And, uh, and, and they told uh, amazing stories of bravery and suffering of uh, Americans that they're just the best soldiers in the world. Are there any that you feel comfortable retelling? Oh, um, I did, uh, it's only one, and it makes me sad, but a friend of mine at, in the 82nd Airborne Division, his, his name was Mo Atherton. He was the, from Texas, he was the state 100-yard dash champion in high school. And um, he uh, jumped on a grenade to save uh, two other guys that were with him. He died. And uh, um, I heard about that um, a year later when I was in Thailand. But he was my friend, and, and, uh, and uh, I knew he would. Those are things that you, that, you know, when a grenade pops in and three guys look at it, uh, uh, you just wonder, is someone going to jump on it and save the other two? And, and Mo did. He was, he was, he's my hero. Um, what were, where were you when you first found out that you could return home? Uh, I was back in Thailand, and uh, I was safe. And uh, uh, when I wasn't in Vietnam or in Laos, Thailand was a great place to be. So <laughs> it, 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 uh, it wasn't that I was waiting to go back. I was working hard, treating lots of people each day. And uh, I liked Thailand. And so um, I heard, you know, got my orders. And I, I was ready to c come back to the United States because it, it's hot and tough. But it wasn't, you know, my my con combat time was over. 
what were your like first thoughts and feelings towards it? Of coming home? Yeah. Um, I was upset uh, hearing about the protests for the war um, and very angry about some of the movie stars and people that were making it worse for our soldiers. And so I, I wondered how I'd get along with some, some of the people I'd need to get along with. Were you in contact with your family while you were in Thailand? Yes, but the only way to do that was um, by letter, and it was hard to do. It would take a month to get a letter back and forth, and so uh, I wasn't very good at communicating that way. So I was uh, anxious to see my mother, and she was worried about me. Is that what you were looking forward to most? Yes seeing my mother, <laughs> and getting a home-cooked meal, <laughs> getting a cheeseburger. <laughs> um, what was the first thing that you did when you got off the plane? Well, um, I, I was decommissioned in, uh, in California, the Travis Air Force Base, and the first thing I did was eat a cheeseburger. <laughs> because the army supplied them to us, had cheeseburgers and apple pie, and and that's and so uh, you know the and it took us uh, a couple days to out process. Um, do you still talk to veterans you were close with during Vietnam? My closest friends probably are veterans because of the experience we had in common. Uh, I don't, I don't have any that live in Colorado, so I don't see them very often. But when you're at war with somebody, you uh, uh, there's there's nothing that else that can get people close like that. Were you ever criticized when you came home? Um, I had different views than some of the friends. And it was so frustrating to me that I just didn't talk about it. It's easier to just not talk about the war and the, was it right, was it wrong? Um, doesn't matter then, we just needed to end the war by quitting or winning. And, and I, um, I feel very strongly about uh, people that criticized our soldiers. Our soldiers were drafted, some enlisted, but they're just doing their job. And it made me furious to see people making fun of our soldiers, and they did. Um, did you ever like, see any protests when you got back, or had all of that been over with? I saw it on, yeah, there was, uh, yes. Uh, there were major protests. When I got back, the war went on for another uh, I guess a year, and uh, uh, it, it's a part of our country that I believe they have the right to do uh, in a tasteful way, and some were tasteful and some were not. What were your usual reactions to that? I was proud of the people that protested in a civilized, respectful way and still loved our soldiers and I'm furious and have never forgiven the people that were uh, abusive and, and uh, disrespectful to our soldiers. Um, when looking back on Vietnam, what were some of the things that you actually liked about it? Oh, the, the Vietnamese people are wonderful, the ocean people are wonderful, the food is great. It's a beautiful country, um, so it, 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 it's, uh, it was shockingly beautiful, which is such a contrast to having people trying to kill each other in this beautiful country, knowing that the people on the other side are just they're the same as we are.
they're just they're fighting for their country or their leaders or they were drafted. There was, there was, you can't realize that until you're at war, until you see dead enemy and dead friendly, and they're all the same. It just, it, it was shocking to me to, in, to one soldier, that uh, an enemy soldier in Vietnam, when we went through his belongings and saw a picture of his wife and kids. Just, it was odd. Were you ever surprised in a good way? No. War is awful. <laughs> it, it's awful. Necessary at times, but awful. The, the, the surprise is how brave soldiers are. Uh, just am amazingly brave, but uh, war is just awful. I didn't realize how awful it was. What would you say was the most like, surprising or shocking experience or events? And... Um, humanizing it to me, like I mentioned, understanding that the soldiers on the other side are just like you. They're, they're trying to stay alive, they're trying to kill you, but they don't hate you, they're just doing their job. Was there anything that you regretted? Um, I regretted not communicating with my family better. I didn't realize the pain that they were feeling, not knowing where I was and hearing from me just every few months or longer. I didn't, didn't I regret not, uh, not letting them know more about that I was okay and, and how much I loved them. How did the military help you as a person? Well, um, I'm a better man because of being in the military. Uh, um, the being in, in a war, uh, there are experiences that you can only get in being in a war, and um, um, it just made me appreciate the American way. It's the it's the finest country in the world, the fairest, the bravest, the most generous, and uh, that's why it just it it really bothers me to hear people whining about the United States of America. They ought to go live somewhere else. They won't like it. Um, if you had to describe your experience in what in one word, what would it be? Humbling. Is there anything else you'd like to share that we have not talked about? Well, I'd just um, like to summarize how highly I think of so, uh, the American soldier. Uh, they're the best at what they do. Their job is not to have a political opinion. They work for the president and they're there to do what they're told and they do it. And uh, all, of, you can't, uh, I've had the privilege of, of, of uh, talking to soldiers from Germany, Korea, Russia, Laos, Vietnam, they all fear the American soldier the most because they're so good at what they do. And they're the bravest, the well best trained. So, um, and every, every soldier ought to be uh, praised for doing their job. They're not all perfect, just like Nobody's perfect that works at McDonald's making hamburgers either. But uh, 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 even today, our, uh, I had, I'm retired military, so I stay, I've stayed in military barracks in Hawaii and around. And our our soldiers are the, are the best, and they, they they represent our country well. And uh, it it bothers me to see the television just talk about the, the problems the few problems that we have. And, uh, 
soldiers that that didn't follow what do what they should, and that where the, there's just hundreds of thousands that are laying their life down every day for for uh, everybody for the United States. And so um, I I can appreciate that. I had no concept for that before being in the military. Okay. Well, that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, you're a great interviewer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>